Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondiax. I'm working on my restoration of my little 1950 Fleischmann steam toy this week, and I'm going to make it a shiny new safety valve. There's a lot more to these than you might think, so let's go. Previously, our steam toy got a shiny new boiler, but now this center boiler bushing here, which is the fill hole, also needs to have a safety valve in it, as the original toy did in 1950. Now, I'm not going to be able to source a 1950 Fleischmann safety valve, so I'm going to make one starting with this piece of hex bar stock here on the lathe. I'm not starting from scratch or winging this. I've actually got this design for a steam safety valve. This is Kozo Hill Oka's design for the Pennsylvania A3 switcher locomotive. I'm going to be simplifying it and shrinking it down a little bit so it's a little bit more to scale for this boiler and simplifying it so that there's fewer parts. This little stationary boiler doesn't need to be as sophisticated safety valve wise as a locomotive does. Locomotive safety valves actually have a lot going on. Steam safety valves in general have to do a trickier job than you might think. The naive implementation would be a simple check valve with a spring on it that is calibrated to open at the desired boiler pressure limit. However, that isn't going to work very well. If you could imagine some sort of ideal spring that opens at exactly, say, 20 psi and then closes again, what's going to happen is it's just going to vibrate at 20 psi. So we really, you need a small amount of hysteresis. You need it to open at, say, 20 psi and then close again at, say, 17 or 18 psi. The size of that hysteresis is called the blowdown pressure, and you don't want it to be too large because otherwise you're just wasting a lot of steam, steam that you've spent fuel to acquire. Kozo's design has the valve bonnet with a little orifice in it that can be filed to tune the blowdown pressure. I'm going to simplify this design because the blowdown pressure is a lot less critical on a little toy like this than it is on a locomotive boiler. The other trick with a safety valve is you want it to have crisp valve events. You want it to snap all the way open as quickly as possible at the set pressure, vent a bunch of steam down to blowdown pressure, and then close securely and quickly. That's actually pretty difficult to do. That's probably the hardest part of safety valve design. Finally, the most important safety feature of the safety valve is it has to have enough volume that it can empty steam out of the boiler faster than the fire creates it. On a steam locomotive with a coal-fired or wood-fired boiler where you can't shut off the fuel source, this is extremely critical. That safety valve has to be able to outpace the fire. As we build this safety valve, I'll explain to you all the different features that are hopefully going to achieve all of those different goals. It all starts with a simple hole down the center to pass through the steam. My tailstock DRO that I built recently is going to come in very handy on this job because we have a lot of very accurately depthed drilling that needs to happen. Starting with this brad point drill. Brad point drills are the model engineer's secret weapon for creating valve bodies and similar structures. I'm going to create a little shoulder at the bottom of this where the valve seat is going to go. Then I need to come in with a slightly larger drill and enlarge this. This becomes the main smoothbore valve body where the valve plug can slide up and down. The diameter of that first brad point drill was chosen very carefully because it matches the guide diameter on the end of my valve seat cutting tool. This is a tool that I made on my D-bit grinder. It's got a 15 degree angle on it that creates a positive cone in the bottom of the valve seat and it's got a little guide diameter around it so that the work itself supports the cutting tool as it's cutting the valve seat. I need to find the end of that tool on the surface of the work, which I'll do with a feeler gauge so I can calibrate my DRO and cut this to exactly the correct depth. You can see this little positive 15 degree cone that we're creating on Kozo's drawing in the upper left. You might be wondering how does a positive cone create a valve seat? You'll see that in a minute. Here's a look at all of the features we've got so far. We've got the positive 15 degree cone in the bottom that will become the valve seat, a little shoulder above that, and then the smooth bore area where the valve plug slides up and down, and then the outermost part of that smooth bore is now going to be tapped for the valve bonnet. And this is not just to secure the bonnet, the valve bonnet is tapped so that we can thread it in and out a, bit, a little bit and adjust the pressure by compressing or uncompressing the spring as needed. Spring pressure is nonlinear because of Hooke's law, so a little bit of threaded area can adjust the opening pressure of the valve quite a bit. 
with all of that tricky interior work done. I'm now going to shape the outside of this. I'm trying to make this valve look as small as possible, so I've shortened it from Kozo's design and I'm cutting it to a little bit smaller diameter. This valve is designed for a three and a half inch gauge locomotive, which is quite a bit bigger than this steam toy. So if I make it just to the drawings, it's going to probably look oversized. However, I don't want to make it too small. I don't want to just scale down this design because safety valves don't actually scale down linearly very well performance wise, and it's going to get very difficult to make if I scale it down too far. Now I'll cut a little chamfer on there to make it look nice because of course chamfers are what separate us from the animals. That's all for this end of the valve, so I'll find the end with my parting blade and cut this off to length. In case it wasn't clear, I started with hex bar stock because the final valve body is going to have a hexagonal profile in the middle of it for a wrench, and for these little plumbing fittings it saves you a ton of time to start with hex bar, and then you don't have to cut the hex profile at the end, which is pretty time consuming. Now I can flip this around, and I've got some aluminum shim in the form of soda can packing to hold it without damaging the surface of that hex bar, and I'm going to face off the far end of it. And then I have a little thread to put on this end of it. This is the M61 thread that goes into the top of the boiler, so I've got to turn it down a long way to get to that small diameter. Somewhat annoyingly, my metric dies don't fit in my tailstock die holder. I really need to buy better metric dies, but I haven't quite needed to cut enough metric threads here to be bothered to do that. Finally, with a parting blade, I'll cut an undercut at the base of this thread to make sure it can thread all the way into the boiler bushing and seat nicely on the top face of it. That will look nice and also helps it seal a little bit. It gives the Loctite 545 an extra little surface to goop into. That looks like that'll work pretty well. Then, of course, chamfer this end as well to make it look nice. And there we have it, one completed safety valve body. That's where all of the complexity is functionality-wise, but the next piece is actually the most difficult to make. And that is the valve plug. So I'll start with round bar this time. I'm going to face off the end as is tradition. And I'm going to start by cutting the ball seat in the end of it. We use a stainless steel ball bearing as the actual valve itself. So I want to create a press fit in the end of this for the ball, which I thought I could do with this drill. I had a drill that should be a little bit undersized, but as drills often do, it cut a little oversized, unfortunately. So that ball is too loose. No biggie though, I just lopped the end off of that and tried again, starting with a smaller drill this time, so the ball doesn't go in there yet, which is good, it's what I want. I would like to open this up with a boring bar to the perfect size, but my smallest boring bar won't fit in there. So rather than go grind a new one, I have a different trick. This is one of my favorite secret weapons in the hobby shop. This is an undersized reamer. It cuts between half and one thou under nominal size. And now that ball is very definitely a press fit. It doesn't quite go all the way in, and in fact, just touching it, it kind of got stuck in there. So I know it's really close to a light press fit. And, uh, well, actually, now I had trouble getting it out. I do actually need to get it out of there because I have a bunch of other work to do on this. Just, uh, hmm. Um, uh-oh. This magnet is not quite strong enough to fish it out of there. And, of course, I can't pick it out of there because it's perfectly smooth and hemispherical. But don't worry, there's no problem that can't be solved with more magnets. Working on the outside of the plug now. First, the overall diameter gets turned to be an easy sliding fit in that smooth bore, the main part of the valve body, so that this section can slide up and down without hitting the threads or anything else that's inside that valve body. Next is a really crucial feature. We put a little shoulder on the end of this. This shoulder gives the steam somewhere to build up behind. It gives it some surface area to push on. The intent of this is to create that crisp valve opening event that I talked about. 
when the ball first unseats, steam is going to start seeping through there. And if left to its own devices, it'll just keep seeping and the valve will never really pop fully open. However, this little shoulder creates a little cavity, a little pocket right around the valve seat. And that first little bit of steam that seeps out accumulates in this pocket and it creates a larger pressure that then is enough to snap the valve all the way open, at which point the higher gas flow keeps it open. But without that little shoulder, it would just seep forever and there wouldn't be enough pressure buildup under the ball sitting on the seat to pop it all the way open. Like I said, safety valve design is hard. That's why I'm not trying to design this myself. Next up, we need to make a very thin stem at the top of this valve plug. So for that, I'm gonna grind myself a special tool. I'm making a left-hand turning tool for brass, which I didn't happen to have yet. This isn't something I do a lot of. You'll see why I'm gonna use a left-hand turning tool for this in a second. The nice thing about brass is that the tool geometry is extremely simple. It only takes a few minutes to grind a new tool like that. Zero top break, super easy. Now I'm gonna start by grooving the base of the stem all the way down close to final diameter. And I need to do this close to the chuck because otherwise there isn't enough strength in the material to stand up to the very high tool pressure of a grooving tool. I have to do this groove at one end or the other and I don't think it would stand up to the tool pressure at the far end. The purpose of this groove is to give me access with the turning tool. If this was a larger diameter part or maybe a steel part, I'd probably do the whole thing with the grooving tool because this is an inside shoulder detail. However, I'm going to use a turning tool because, again, the final stem that we're creating is going to be very thin and a single point turning tool has much, much lower pressure. The final diameter of this stem is just 60 thousandths and 60 thousandths of brass is not very strong. So I don't want to use anything more than the lightest of cuts with a single point turning tool. But you can see how I'm able to work my way down with a left hand turning tool, leaving that designed in shoulder that's close to the ball pocket while keeping the tool pressure as low as possible, far away from the chuck. Because I'm using a left-hand turning tool, I can't get right up to the chuck, but that's good because it leaves a little thicker area at the base, which helped to support that material that I was turning down. And now I come in with a regular right-hand turning tool and thin down the area close to the chuck. So by working in stages like this, going from the far side to the near side, I keep as much rigidity in the material as I go along as possible. And then because the dimension of this is fairly important, I finish up with some emery to bring it right down to as close to exactly 60 thousandths as I could get. Manufacturing wise, that was probably the most difficult operation on this safety valve, but that seems to have gone well. So Yahtzee that off and ooh, that was close. I have had parts get caught in the chuck and mangled due to a weird release at the parting blade, but got lucky that time. That little valve plug is intact and looking good. Moving on now to the valve bonnet. That's the part that seals this whole shenanigan into one piece. This is a very simple little disc in my modification of Kozo's design. It threads into the top of the valve body. Kozo's design has quite an elaborate stem-shaped bonnet because it needs to stick up through the steam dome on the locomotive and we don't need any of that here, so I can make the whole valve a lot smaller by making it a simple flat disc. So once I put the thread on it, I set it up vertically on the mill in a collet block, line up on that center hole, and I'm going to drill four little holes around the outside. And the purpose of these holes is to make sure that the valve has enough cross-sectional area to pass the same amount or more than the amount of gas that can flow through the orifice at the bottom, which itself has to be sized to, as I said at the beginning, pass more gas than the coal fire or solid fuel fire can produce. There we go. There's the three main pieces of the valve itself. And I've got a stainless steel ball bearing that will act as the valve seat. Now I drop that ball in there. You can see it sitting on that little positive cone. And to create the actual valve seat itself, we do one more final little operation. With that ball sitting in there on that delicate positive 15 degree cone, I give that a good whack with a brass drift and that deforms that little cone to form a perfect valve seat. This is an old model engineer's trick and after that you should only be able to blow through it one way if that valve is sealing well, which it seems like it is. So moving on now I can do some assembly. This ball bearing is a press fit in the pocket, but just for good measure I threw a little Loctite in there as well. 
but now we need that all-important spring. And of course it has to be stainless steel because this is a steam environment. And for that, I bought this set of stainless steel springs rather than trying to make my own like I usually do. Wanted to save some effort here. This set was not cheap, and that's because these springs are actually stainless steel. Fun fact, if you go and buy any of the many, many sets of stainless steel springs on Amazon that are one-tenth of the price of this set, you will find that none of them are actually stainless. Yes, every single stainless spring set on Amazon, as far as I can tell, is in fact galvanized, and they will rust within minutes of contact with live steam. I have learned that the hard way, as have many one-star reviewers on all of those cheap sets. So buy from a reputable supplier if you need your stainless steel springs to actually be stainless and not just shiny. But one of these springs should do the trick. I'll need to do some experimenting. Let's get this assembled now. The valve plug goes in there, sits down on that hammered valve seat. Then I'll try this spring first. This goes on over that little stem like so. And then the valve bonnet screws in there and seals it all together. A couple of little drill bits allow me to tighten that that valve bonnet down to whatever it needs to be to compress the spring the correct amount. And this is going to be a very simple trial and error process to see if one of these springs will work. I made a little fixture that allows me to attach the valve to my low pressure regulator airline. My goal is to see what the opening pressure is with this particular spring. It's not actually easy to tell when it's open. You can feel the air coming out of the hole, so I'm holding my finger over it. But you can also test it by pushing down on the valve stem and manually closing the valve. Safety valves all seep a little bit sometime before they open. So it's going to sound like it's leaking, but it's really not appreciably leaking until it fully opens all the way. And you can tell that that has happened by pushing down on the stem. If the pressure doesn't change appreciably, then it wasn't open. If, however, if you push down on the stem and the pressure jumps up a bit, then you know that it was in fact open and it was passing all of the pressure down to whatever the compressor was trying to produce. To ensure that it can pass enough volume and outpace the fire, there's a lot of complicated math and some old timer wisdom in boiler design to work that out. However, in this case, I'm not worried about it because I know that my design is a lot larger than the Fleischmann factory design was, so it should have no trouble dumping enough steam. So I'm just trying to find the right spring pressure. And with some trial and error, I found this spring that seemed to open at 11 PSI, and that actually seems pretty good. That is probably about right. I was looking for something kind of in that 10 to 20 PSI range. I think that should be lots for this little toy, and I certainly don't want to go any higher than that. So I think 11 should be just fine. There's my little safety valve built to someone else's design, hopefully. So that means it'll work because I don't know anything about safety valve design but it seemed to work pretty well on compressed air, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. Let's get that installed on the boiler and see if it looks the part. I'm pretty pleased with the size of it. It came out smaller than the whistle, so it seems reasonably in scale for this tiny little boiler. I mean, as small as I can get it anyway. And I'd say that looks pretty good on there. Pretty pleased with how that came out, honestly. It's certainly more sophisticated than the factory safety valve was. I think the factory one was just a check valve with a spring on it. This one should perform a little bit better than that, I think, assuming I built it correctly, but we won't really know until we test it on live steam, which will be coming up in a future video in this series. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something interesting about steam safety valves. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this one. Thanks to my patrons for making all this happen, and I'll see you next time.